All right, so we will, we will stick with the landslide theme, if you still have energy to follow um, after this rather dense talk. We'll do something a bit uh, different and actually a bit more straightforward, um, yet on the other hand also a bit, bit difficult. Uh, Andre has been talking uh, largely about use of multispectral information. Um, we have been wondering to what extent we could do what we have been doing with panchromatic data. And when you start looking at landslides in black and white imagery, um, things are suddenly not very clear, but we wanted to see to what extent we could use panchromatic data for sort of like an event series inventorization over a number of years. So um, this work uh, is with, uh, with actually with Tapas Mata, I should say. He, he was my PhD student who finished, finished last year. He is at the National Remote Sensing Center in Hyderabad in India. And so he was kind of the, the main worker behind this. Um, introduction is quite straightforward. Uh, we want to have a method to allow us to do rapid mapping of many landslides in inaccessible uh, terrain, either because there are, there are many people, it's very important to get this done very quickly to, to organize our, our response activities, or simply because there are so many slides and, and, and doing it manually is just, uh, just not an option. Um, Pixel-based methods have been tried many times before, and we all know the limitations. So using object-oriented analysis and bringing in our expert knowledge for, uh, for landslides is just a, a logical way forward. And in the end, that also generates GIS-ready information we can use for, for risk assessment. Um, so here we are talking specifically about an event uh, that took place in the Himalayas in 2010. So this is a pre-event image, and this is what it looked like afterwards. So you can appreciate a, a pretty large number of, of landslides. Uh, some are clearer than, than others, and mapping that is not so straightforward. Uh, you can also scale it up. I mean, Andre also showed some, some, some credible, uh, uh, you know, uh, massive uh, instances of landslides, and, and this will be one of them from, from New Zealand. If you have to do this manually, it's just really a, a whole lot of work. And if you try to take the color out of this image, and uh, while well, you get this, it doesn't get any easier. So we wanted to see if it can still be done. So to do that, we identified three gaps in our current knowledge. The first one relates to, to the use of panchromatic information, so not having any NDVI and so forth uh, to work with. Um, um, Oh, no, actually, sorry, so the first one is what, what if we don't have multispectral information, which does happen frequently? What if we only have uh, 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 panchromatic information? Can it still be done? Second gap is, okay, what if we don't have NDVI as an initial uh, decision criterion? And also, what if we are interested in a sort of like historic inventory analysis? And when we want to go back to historic data, archive data, oftentimes they are panchromatic as well. So. Uh, I think enough motiv uh, motivation to say that we want to have a method that also works with black and white data. So uh, the, the processing is, is quite straightforward. Again, we consider objects to be the, the most uh, logical, natural basis for this type of work. Uh, so everything starts with image segmentation, and then we start bringing in our, our knowledge, shape, texture, context, and, and, and so forth. Um, and it's really an opportunity to bring in both sort of our geographic information, but also everything we know about morphology, morphometry, and so forth. Yeah? And then that is the basis for an iterative uh, process tree, uh, sort of topological network that, that brings in this type of, of information and knowledge uh, successively. Okay? And so making use of as much information as, as possible, going back to your earlier question. If you have a DM, of course, that's going to be a, 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 of great advantage. If you had geological or soil information, you could also use that. Okay. Now, um, we have done quite a bit of work in this field already, and it all starts with a conceptualization. Right? What is a, what is a landslide, really? And when you think about it, we know quite a bit. Yeah, so we know something about uh, the source and the slide path and the position area, uh, sort of length width ratios that might be relevant, or something about the, the, the source area, be it the material type or elevation changes and so forth, or maybe distance to additional features. That has sort of been the, 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 the underlying cornerstone of all of our work. And that started with a, with a paper in geomorphology. Where, where we showed, again, how, how this can be done, how you can use OA uh, to map landslides using these principles. Um, from there on, we moved on to, to a paper that also Tapas wrote in IEEE on objective segmentation, so how we can get away from this, from this trial and error segmentation. 
Um, then we did some work with Ping Lu. Uh, Andre was also involved in that on change detection, using these principles to assess changes. And then most recently, uh, the work that Andre just presented on objective parameter selection. So this has been quite a, quite a nice sequence of, of work that's still ongoing. Um, tomorrow I will talk about a, a, a study where we use uh, 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 LIDAR data, for example, using OA and LIDAR data. And currently we're also working with PS INSAR data to try to see if it can also be done with, with, with this type of radar data. Now, uh, we did this work in the, in the Himalayas, so very close to the, to the northern edge of the country, really. Um, and we have two different study areas, Okimas and Almora. Um, the methodology is, is quite straightforward. You see it's a basic change detection between two time instances, so a pre and a post image, um, where we do the initial segmentation based on the post image, so where the lens slides are in, and points to pay attention to is really that um, uh, we have to use brightness initially because we do not have NDVI as an initial decision criterion. So brightness is a very tricky animal, as you know that. It's very, it's highly variable. It's not nearly as robust as NDVI. Um, and down here, uh, closer to the bottom, this is where we bring a lot of texture information because this is a, uh, a highly used area with lots of tea gardens and agricultural terraces and so forth. So again, texture is your only way to get rid of false positives there. And this kind of context, contextual information in conjunction with texture turns out to be, to be critical. Um, if you want to do any change detection, it requires some pre-processing, as you, as you all know. Um, we did auto-rectify our image, starting with a post-disaster image and using a 10-meter DM generated from Cartosat data, so the Indian Cartosat satellite. Um, then we did an image-to-image -image, uh, co-registration, top of atmosphere, uh, a reflectance calculation, a histogram matching, etc. before we did our segmentation and uh, uh, OA processing. Now, this is where we get to the first hurdle again. How do we segment? How do we segment objectively? Um, most of you will be familiar with the work by Lucien Dragut uh, et al., this ESP tool, the, the Estimation of Scale Parameter tool. Um, it gives you this chart, and then you kind of have to pick and say, well, is it going to be that value or that value? It gives you kind of one relevant scale parameter. So the problem is that in most images you have more than one, right? So it's, it, we've always struggled with this kind of concept. So Tapas has been working for quite some time on this, and uh, uh, together we developed this, what we call a plateau objective function, which is, uh, is a test where you do a range of different segmentations, like 50 different segmentations, and then you test each segment for internal variance, and also using Moran's I, which is a measure of spatial autocorrelation between adjacent segments. The idea is that you're trying to find uh, scale parameters, which really gives you the most optimal balance of these two values, and there can be more than one. So what you end up uh, getting is a chart like this, and you see this little uh, dotted black line. This is simply uh, the standard deviation of all these 50 values. So we consider this to be our plateau, and we see any peak above that will represent a significant scale parameter for the given image. Right? Now, here it looks quite good. I could also show you examples where it's less clear. Of course, picture an area where you have a large number of different land cover units of different type, but all of a like, similar size, and you will end up with a nearly flat line. So this doesn't always work. Right? But uh, we've used it. We also use it with LiDAR data, as I will show tomorrow. And in principle, it has shown to be uh, quite robust. So here, in this case, we would use these, different, these three different peaks that are indicated uh, here above the plateau and uh, perform a segmentation and then look for specific false positives in here. And I would refer you to, to, to the paper uh, uh, for more details. So again, the way it works is that you start with a post-disaster image, so with a, with a failed image, so that you see at the top of here where you have these big landslides, and you start using it as a, as a basis for your segmentation. But if you then do a, a comparison of pre and post simply using a global brightness value this will not always work. Yeah, this has to be done locally. So what we're doing is two things. One is that we iteratively go from landslide to landslide candidate and do a local comparison. So it's a local brightness threshold rather than a, than a global one. But also we use a sub-segmentation level. So a sub-object that you see here and do an individual comparison because if you average the brightness value over a large 
segment, chances are that you'll be missing actually most of the landslides as well. Again, some of the details, or these details are also indicated uh, uh, or described in detail in this, in the paper. So, um, I just want to focus a bit more on the, on the challenges. Now, imagine you had a, an image like this and you had to find landslides. It's extremely difficult. There are very subtle texture features in there. Um, and that's what we, what we describe and we try to elicit that from these data. And so here, for example, in blue, we then identify these, these landslides because of topography, flow direction, direction of texture. They are different from, from agricultural terraces, for example. Um, we also find very small landslides, and we can actually distinguish them quite nicely, uh, as, you see, as you see here, for example, um, again, using, using terrain information. Um, but we also, we also have uh, very complex features here, for example, if you consider this large landslide body or this agglomeration, really, uh, it's, it's quite a challenge. If we only do a straightforward change detection using a, a global threshold value, on the left-hand side, you see that we're actually finding the main body, but we are missing many of the small features, as indicated in these yellow circles. However, in our iterative processing on a candidate-per-candidate candidate basis using a local threshold as well as context, our contextual processing, we find nearly all of these landslides, including the small ones, and only using panchromatic information. Uh, the same works when we use our, our terrain information to find features which would otherwise be mistaken, for example, for, uh, for riverbeds. Like here, you see these, these two slides that are dumping material into the river, and if you look at it in the image, it just looks like part of the, of the, uh, uh, sort of the river sense, but uh, by using this context information and uh, terrain information, we can actually identify them quite reliably. Um, we can also trace individual landslides quite well. So here you see it over over space of a few years. Uh, we can monitor individual landslides and even see reactivation. So, for example, in the in the third uh, uh, box here, you see that there are no landslides detected yet. Uh, uh, a year later, they actually were reactivated and came back. So you can actually do a per landslide kind of like a uh, inventorization and cataloging of a feature. So. For results, uh, for the Almora sites, we identified uh, some 140 landslides automatically, some very, very small, so down to about 62 uh, square meters. Um, again, sometimes you have very interesting candidates that are, that, are, that are complex and interesting in their own right, and you can also describe those changes quite accurately. As you can see here, between 2003 and 2005, uh, you have a kind of like retrogressive movement going, going sort of like upslope of these, of these slide features. Um, uh, we also use this to create a, a landslide inventory map, and I'm only showing you part of it. Um, uh, I'm showing you three maps out of nine. So for each year, you can actually map and trace and quantify and visualize all the relevant changes related to landslides uh, in the study area uh, quite robustly. So. Um, there are still limitations. Um, there are still some, some, some manual setting of, uh, of, of, uh, of thresholds, as I sh showed in the previous uh, talk. Um, but also, you know, the, the plateau objective function is nice, and we considered an improvement over, over the ESP. However, what it indicates here are only relevant scale parameters, but what they refer to, what type of feature, uh, it doesn't say. Right? So when it comes to, uh, to, to interpreting the chart and say, okay, I have, a, I have a, a peak at 15 and a peak at 25, uh, to work out what exactly that corresponds to, which type of false positive or which part of the landslide, we still have re haven't really found a good, uh, good solution for. Um, on the positive note that I want to finish with, um, the method has been found to be accurate uh, as well as rapid not necessarily a match for visual interpretation. If you are an, an experienced geomorphologist who's been doing a stereo analysis for 20 years, we don't come close, let's face it. I mean, there, there are subtle indicators in terms of brightness changes that, that, that only humans supposedly can, can, can pick up. So there's still limitation here. However, we did uh, have a detection accuracy around about 88%. It was quite, quite nice. Um, 
And it is a semi-automatic method that provides flexibility also to the user to make modifications to adapt this rule set also for other areas. And that also makes it cost effective, especially if you don't have to track to remote areas. So um, with that, I would thank you. And again, I'm repeating myself. I would refer you to our website for more information. We also put some of our rule sets actually on the ITC uh, uh, OA group website. So you can actually download them and try them. Okay? So. If there are any questions, I'd be happy to try to answer them. Thank you.